how y'all doing today? I'm glad y'all get to see me here like this, you know what I mean? Because I'm the same person I was before I took this setback, you know what I mean? Like, I believe through everything, you know, we think we in control of things, but we're not. I learned something very valuable in this camp, preparing for this fight, is that no matter what you do, how you prepare for it, God is in control, you know what I mean? Like, that's why I'm at this moment in my career right now where I'm able to handle this with a humble heart. And it's funny because if I was arrogant, you know, they would have a lot of stuff to write about me. But, you know, I think through everything they can still write the same story. How humble I can take a thing like this, set back, and look at it like, you know, hey, this is the type of stuff that happened in life, you know what I mean? Like, I'm able to handle this type of stuff. I'm glad I have so many supportive people because, you know, when you're, before you get to this moment, you're kind of scared. Like, if somebody asked me, are you scared to get in the ring? I said, I'm not scared to fight. I'm, I'm not even scared to lay down. The only thing I'm scared of is to see how many people that's here for me right now in this moment after our loss disappear. Um, but, you know, it's crazy. I got more people than I thought would disappear still here, right here with me. I thank all my family that came here. Um, I'm a totally changed man. I am. I'm a um, husband to a wonderful wife. I'm a brother to some, some, some knucklehead brothers. I'm a friend to some of the great boxers out here that we went to church with. Shout out Sean Porter, Kenny. Y'all know, um, I think everybody in this room played a part and a purpose in my life where it just reconnected me with God because, you know, every title you can win in this world is not enough. You know, I lift everything that I have up back to God. I just want to impact people in such a special way. It's like, you think about my life, you think about being in Grand Rapids, Michigan, you think about all the struggle, you think about all the drug dealers I was surrounded by, and I never wanted to turn out like them. I just wanted to inspire them and let them know. You can make excuses about life why you can fail, but I always found a reason to make excuse why I should do better, you know? I'm glad, I'm just so happy I'm at this point in my life where I'm able to come and speak to y'all the same way I've always been speaking to y'all. You know, we had some trips and fumbles, but like, you know, the people that I had, but God has lined me with some great people. I want to thank Al Heyman. You know, Al Heyman is a great advisor. You know, I speak to him, and he makes me comfortable with any decision I make, the way I talk, you know. Um, my whole team who's been part of this process with me, Eric, thank you. Let me tell y'all something about Eric. You know, I went out to train with Freddie Roach, and, um, you know, I went through several of Freddie's assistants, and none of them worked for me. I said, Freddie, man, you got to put me with the one that you know it's going to be a big good fit for me. He put me with Eric, and Eric has been in my corner. You know what I'm saying? He's still here with me. I brought Rafael Ramos back with me, working with me. He's one of my first amateur coaches. You know, we had some ups and downs, but, you know, now man, I'm here with him, you know, because I we had a, such a bad story. I said, said, I wouldn't be a man if I didn't let you allow you to fix your own story. Forgive yourself for all the troubles we've been through. Yeah. Thank you. My brothers, you know what I'm saying? Lil said, I want to let you know, you know what I'm saying? This is how you react when you got the public looking at you, you know? This is the example I'm trying to set for you that, you know, God has got a plan for you too if you believe it. You know, the streets don't love you back. You know what I mean, the streets name is going to be there when you're dead and gone. So you got to make sure that whatever you do in life, you come to him, you know, support your lovely lady, marry her, because she's such a special mother to your kid that when I see her, I, I feel like she's my little sister. Same with Jolene, I love you too. Thank y'all for coming because you're special to me too. Shanae, all my friends, Johnny. Where Johnny at? Johnny got dreads, he gonna cut his dreads off. Cause he know he look ugly, but he's my best friend. No matter what y'all think about this guy, this guy has been in my corner since I started, always been my inspiration. He's here with me doing the same exact thing he was doing when we was in middle school. You know what I mean? And he's still doing it. And now it's a job for him. I know it put a lot of pressure on him, but I love him. Antoine Gooch, my best friend. You know what I'm saying? He the one that managed me. He, he sits down with me and we work out things. And 
even know that he looks like the bad guy, but I know it's all for a greater purpose. He's a God believer too, God fearing man. Allison, my wife, you know, for a long time I was like, man, God, what is it? Why, why am I married to a Jewish girl? I know it's not to save my checks. <laughs> um, I told her about this, about this fight. It's like you see all this attention I get. That I think I got to plant a seed in your heart too to let you know God's work is so tremendous. We don't know. We don't have no understanding for that. But it's so tremendous that people would not realize what he's doing with your life until you know you got a purpose. Pablo, I love you too because you've been here from day one since the bottom with me. Since the IHOP days, since I used to serve you pancakes. <laughs> but, you know, Lou DeBella, thank you so much. You know, I hope you've seen some growth in me too as well. Because you've been a good guy to me too. You gave me opportunity on many different cards. What, what I'm seeing right now, man, is, is, is as impressive as it can be. So. Oh, man, thank you. Congratulations. Sylvia, I love you. You're such a special woman. She's been there for me. They won behind the scenes. You know, it's a lot of people... I want to be with somebody that's successful, just to be seen with them. But like, when you get people like you, I really appreciate it because you know this. This is what get me by, man. Every day, I'm thankful. Um, everybody that played a purpose. You know who you are. Doesn't matter. You know I don't have to say your name. You know what purpose you played. Um, you know Kenny, you played purpose too. You know, I had to let you know you look slick all the time. I try to be like you. You know what I mean. Sam, thank you so much. Um, all the media here who's been covering my career for such a long time. Now I don't want to talk like, yo, this the end of Kid Chocolate. You know, this is only a beginning to a, a bigger plan that it would, I didn't know about. You know what I'm saying? So um, thank you all so much, Ness. You know, I believe in you a lot. You know what I mean? Even though I feel like you be biased sometimes. But <laughs> you gotta do what you got to do. But Allison, you know what I'm saying? I love you. You're my wife. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like when you ain't got nobody to go home to, I can always come home and you get a hug and it feels warming. You know what I mean? Not disrespect to my mom, cause my mom used to give me the hugs, but now I got a wife and I'm so thankful to have her. Got a wonderful kid. Man, this is amazing. But look, I don't wanna take too much of y'all time. I think they gonna probably open y'all up for some answers, I mean questions, and I'm gonna answer them truthfully with my heart. Thank y'all so much for um, being here with me with this moment. Right there, right there, right there with the microphone. Hey, Peter. What's up, Dan? How you doing? I'm good. Uh, good. Uh, I'm wondering. I mean, you're, you're, what you're saying here is impressive, and uh, you know, you're, you're handling yourself the way you would hope that somebody that comes off a tough fight like this would handle themselves. But I wonder how how in shock are you, and at what point do you think when you're alone and you're just thinking about it that you're going to really comprehend what happened tonight? I think the hardest part is not having God with the the moments. You know what I mean, like. To be honest with y'all, this moment played out. You know, it's about whatever, whatever plan. Cause you know, you always told you're gonna be undefeated, you're gonna knock him out, you're gonna do this, and next thing you know, it don't happen that way. So I took it with an open and humble heart that, you know, this guy's got a cancer story. He's fighting tremendously with a story that, you know, when you're fighting with that kind of reason, the only way you can accept it if it go the way that it did is to have it with a humble heart. So I guess that's what it is. I have one other question for you. When Harvey Doc stopped the fight, how aware of what was going on were you? Because you, you seemed, at least from outside the ring, to, to you know, a good stoppage, that you were you know, maybe in a position where you were going to get hurt because you didn't really know what was going on. Uh, what, what is your, re your recollection of that moment when the stoppage happened? Did you know what was happening and how were you feeling? Harvey was definitely doing his job, you know. Um, as as y'all can see, if y'all follow me on social media, you know, I was always sending prayers and, you know, for Pritchard Cologne, you know, I could never imagine being in that moment, you know what I'm saying? So um, it's best that people like that that's got those type of jobs do the best that they can do so they can avoid situations happen like that. Think anything is possible, you know what I mean? A rematch, but you know, like I said, if I didn't take the time to sit down with my family and you know, talk it over with the people that mean a lot to me, because as a fighter, we're gonna say rematch, rematch, rematch. 
you know, like I don't even know about rest until somebody tell me, Pete, you need to take a rest. So I'm only gonna be speaking like a fighter all the time. Of course you're gonna say, yeah, I want a rematch. But you know, I'm gonna have to sit down with the team and we're gonna come up with the best plans for Peter Quarter. Hey, Pete. What's up? Good afternoon. How you doing, Mike? Great to see you, you know, your experience. <clears throat> You know, you talked before the fight about possibly moving to 168. You're a big 160 pounder and you know struggled at times. Does that play any effect? And are you going to go to 68 now? Or? Yeah, like I said, you know, it was something I to really, really consider. You know, um, I know some big names up there, and um, you know, but at this moment right now, I could say whatever sounds like advertising to the media. But I'm gonna have to say, I'm gonna have to sit down and come up logically for the best situation with the team that I have for the best situation for Peter Quill in the best future. Sorry, uh, one more question. One more. You know, what, after Jacobs buckled you the first time, you didn't ever attempt to clinch, and you seem to, you know, you seem to be trying to catch him with a big counter shot. Is that what you... Yeah, you know, um, when you're in the moment, you think like a fighter, you don't care. You know, and that's, you know, those are the moments that really count to make the right kind of decision. I know in life, if you ever make, if you rush a moment and you rush a decision and sometimes it's not a decision that you're able to live with, things like that can happen. But, you know, relaying to life, but now this is a fight, same thing can happen. You can make a bad decision in a moment and it'll cost you. Hey, Pete, how you doing? How you doing? Man, from Brooklyn Fights, I want to say uh, thank you for a good fight. God bless thank you, you. and your fish and everything. Um, you know, coming to the fight, you train very hard. You look great, you know, you look great, you sparring and everything. Was there anything outside that kind of surprised you with Danny and, and then, you know, him coming forward with the attack that he had. No, actually, I've seen that already happening. He was determined, you know what I mean? When somebody determined, you can't take that away from them. So, you know, like, what more can you lose to a guy that is determined, that's coming to try his hardest to do what he got to do? And I'm thankful that I got the Gary Grace to run with Danny Jacobs. Hi, Peter Quill and Curtis Connor here at Cyber State Career in Boston. Once again, great you know, great effort out there. Talk is you know, whenever you lose, there's always change to be made. So going forward, what changes are you gonna be making to either your camp, to your workout? What are some things you're gonna look back and go, I need to do this better going forward? Can't change God's plan. This is the way God's wanted. That was the only thing I can do is go back to the gym, reassess myself with my team and you know, we work together and try our try our best on the next go round. What's up? What's up? I appreciate your humility, brother. Thank you. Um, how does this loss make you a better fighter moving forward? Because outside of making me a better fighter, made me a better man, you know? Because you, you got to be willing to accept the things you don't want to be, you want to accept about yourself. All you hear is you're going to be undefeated. You're going to knock him out. You're going to do this. And then you got a bad thing to happen to you, and you got to accept that. And right when it happened, I accepted it right away. You know what I'm saying? So with that, I think I made a become a better man off of that. The middleweight champion of the world, Danny Jacobs. Privilege, I'm a little hoarse, forgive me. It was a privilege to share the ring with such an incredible athlete, such an amazing person. Um, Peter Quillen, I've known for a very long time. And it sucks when you have someone that, you know, you know everything about him, you know what he's fighting for, and you've known him for so long and have to share the ring with him. I knew going into the fight that, you know, I had to block everything out, all our personal relationship. Whatever it was, I had to block all that out and just focus on the fight. I knew he was going to be strong. I knew he was going to be relentless. And I was just fortunate enough to get uh, the stoppage because he was hurt and not, and I bombarded him. Um, it was a, for, the, for however long it lasted, man, I knew that it was going to be dangerous. And, you know, he's a strong, talented guy. And if he wants to rematch, and if that's something that, you know, the fans would want as well, then we can definitely do it. I would definitely give this man another opportunity to do it again. Thank you. But when we spoke earlier on this week, you said you visualized this outcome. Did you visualize the first round knockout? 
I didn't visualize uh, the knockout. I just visualized me having my hand raised in victory. Um, you know, boxing is mostly mental. And I was at a point where, you know, meditating was something big on, you know, something big that I was doing. And visualizing this victory was something that we've done in camp. So mentally, before even stepping in the ring, I knew that I was ready. Um, physically, we were strong. Physically, we were ready. But ultimately, I feel like um, the fight was already won outside of the ring. Hi, Danny. Yeah, back in the corner. Peter, I, I did have one other question for you. Um, I know you said you appreciated the fact that the way the referee was doing his job, but do you feel that you could have uh, came back at that point um, when they did stop it? You know, I'm a fighter, so automatically I'm going to say yes. But like I said, that's me talking like a fighter and not talking like an official doing my job. So, you know, like I said, you know, the things that happened was meant to happen. <coughs> Again, congrats, congrats again, great performance. Thank you. Do you think this was a star-making performance for you? Um, and you know, how far did you get to go in the sport? Well, Peter Quillen is one of the best middleweights in the world. Yeah. You know, for me to have uh, an upset like this, because it was an upset. Fans had it, him going in as a favorite, him going in as probably knock me out or maybe get the victory. So I don't know if this made me a superstar. I mean. I just want to be able to get inside the ring and do what I do best, have fun, and uh, come out unscathed and in perfect tech. Guys, if um, if there aren't any more questions for Peter, I'm going to let Peter go and be with his family and get some rest. Uh, <laughs> anyway. And I don't think you could handle um, a night like he just had with any more grace than he just showed. So uh, another round of applause. I'm gonna just tell y'all that's the hardest part of fighting Danny is that I'm a big fan of his son. That's a fact. <laughs> that's a fact. Oh man, bittersweet, man, bittersweet. And he doesn't know if he's a superstar, but I'm going to tell you, he's a superstar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I know you're looking to bring more and more awareness to cancer, um, and obviously you'll, your star will shine brighter after this fight. You, how important is it to you that this helps you bring more awareness? It means, it means everything. You know, like I've said, I've always idolized Sugar Ray Leonard, and I've always idolized Muhammad Ali because of what they stood for outside of the ring. So to know that I have something that, you know, people can relate to and uh, something that's devastating is cancer, you know, to be able to overcome that and be kind of a spokesperson for it, you know, to be able to give people hope, to inspire it, and things of that nature. I mean, the platform, I'm looking forward to taking advantage of that, you know, because a lot of people have better stories than I have or have gone through worse situations than I have, but they don't really have that platform to kind of bring awareness to it. So I'm going to do my best to, you know, take advantage of it. Danny, straight back here. Straight back. Over here? Is that Dave? Oh, I don't know. I'm at ESPN. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, buddy. Uh, middleweight's a hot weight class. Uh, this was obviously a much anticipated fight in the weight class. Yes. We had uh, Canelo and Cotto a few weeks ago, uh, Triple G a couple weeks before that. Right. Uh, Lou was talking about the fight he has with his other fighter, Andy Lee, in a yeah. title defense against Saunders. Uh, I guess the question is, what do you want to do next, assuming that there's not going to be an immediate rematch between you and Peter? Um, I mean, I think the... The, the obvious answer would be to say, yeah, leave it up to my manager and, you know, see what works. But I mean, I want to fight the best. You know, I want to be able I, My whole thing was before, obviously coming back, I wanted to get the 12 rounds and to prove to myself that I can go a full 12 round with the elite. And I've done that. I've gone 12 rounds. So now I know I got it in the bank. I'm willing to face any and everybody out there. Um, if it's the winner of Andy Lee Sanders, then that's something that I'll do. Or if it's something, uh, if it's a... a uh, what's Eubanks? Yeah, Chris Eubanks. Yeah, Chris Eubanks Jr. If You're it's mandatory. Like, my mandatory, if it's something that I have to do as far as, you know, fighting the mandatory, that's what I'll do. But, you know, I feel like I'm on fire now, man. You know, I'm ready to take on the best, and I'm in my prime, so. Aww. <laughs> Daddy, uh, Chris Gaughan here, Cyber Station Charade of Boston. We've talked to you for a long time. No one has gone through a peer run with cancer. How sweet is this getting that win against a crosstown rival and actually showing everybody that you can't beat a top five, top ten fighter? Um, 
It's a bittersweet, but I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful that I'm able to, you know, prove the doubters wrong because there was a lot of negativity going into this fight. You know, some of it I just had to block out, like I just erased my Instagram and Twitter and stuff like that because it was so many, so many people bash talking me saying that I wasn't of the elite, I wasn't, you know, that caliber of fighter. And I know deep down inside I was. I mean, I fought Sean Porter in the amateurs six times and we went to war <laughs> every time. So I knew that I, I you know, I knew the skill is there. But boxing is always about proving yourself. And, and, and I think with tonight's victory, that's what we did. Daniel, uh, your last two fights, they ended you know, really early. Uh, your knockout percentage is phenomenal. It's on par with any other you know, professional really in the sport next to Wilder. Uh, do you think this puts you on a level where people look at you as not just a great fighter or great speed, but it actually is a really knockout artist? Or is there anything else that you would need to do to be on that level, like a Golovkin that was a knockout artist? Just continue to do what I've been doing. I mean, that's really not my worries as far as the way I'm placed. I mean, ultimately, yeah, but right now, I think all I need to worry about is just making sure that I, I, I fix the flaws that I have in my game and just worry about perfecting what I have and be the best that I can be. Because with that being done, then, you know, they, they, they can't deny it. They what can't are, deny what are your flaws? Um, I mean, every fighter has flaws. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit here and go through the list, you know what I mean? <laughs> you record it, but, I mean, every fighter has flaws, but, and, and, and it was one thing that Peter alluded to <clears throat> before the fight was even made. He was like, um, you know, I don't really have anything to prove. You know, there's nothing to gain with this fight. And my mentality was every fighter has something to prove, whether it's to themselves or to the sport in general. You're always going to have something to prove, and I feel like that's what I'm doing. And as a student of the game, I understand that, and that's why we're getting better and better. And, you know, me coming into my man's strength now, you're seeing the strength and the power. And I think everything is going to play out phenomenal if I continue to do what I'm doing. What's up, Danny? Andy Emilio, ES News, right over here. Hey, what's up, man? What's up, man? Uh, first and foremost, congratulations on the win. And but if you could put on your commentators hat for a second, <coughs> I'm very good at looking at things objectively. Yeah. How would you um, basically? What's your take on the stoppage? Uh, I mean, he was on shaky legs, so to me, it's kind of a coin toss. You could have let him go, you, you could have let it, you could have stopped it. But if if I was Peter Quillen, I probably would have took a knee. You know, just maybe lose that round and have another round to go and finish the fight. But um, it's not my call. I actually, I didn't even see the fight. I don't even really remember the fight. So I would have to go back in order to make a, you know, an assessment on that. But, you know, the referee is in there to do his job. Where we have a job to do, the referee have a job to do. And um, that's just that, man. This is a sport where um, health is first, right? And you have guys and officials and doctors to make sure that guys are not taking too much punishment because obviously we know with the Pritchard Cologne situation, you know, it was a very unfortunate situation. We don't want to make these things happen again because this is a, you know, this is a deadly sport. Danny, uh, Peter actually said exactly the same, same thing. Right. He just did. Right. And exactly. he applauded Harvey Doc for making yeah. stopping the fight. See, he's a gentleman. See, Peter's a, like, this is a bittersweet moment for me right now because, yeah, I'm happy that I got the victory. Yeah, I'm happy that things are looking bright for the future. But, you know, for a guy like that who I've known for a very long time and, you know, to know his son and he's fighting for just so much and coming from something to nothing, like, I can identify with that. So, you know, it's a bittersweet moment, but, you know, I just I pray that he's okay. Danny, uh, directly on your left, right over here. Hey, sir. <laughs> uh, can, can you tell me, uh, the other day at the press conference, you said you would be very respectful of his power and very cautious. But was it just something instinctual in that moment that when you, when you heard him that caused you to, to go wild like that? Or did you wow. int intend to? <laughs> <laughs> or did you intend to put that kind of pressure on early? Well, see, we have a thing, and I say we, my team, Andre Rose and uh, Anthony Irons, and the rest of my team, Jacobs. We have techniques in the gym where we work on. It's called rumble. So it's like when we have guys hurt, we know exactly what punches to put together, how to bombard a guy, how to corral a guy, and eventually get to stop it. So that was just a part of what we do naturally. Danny, how you doing? Nesta with TheBoxingBoys.com. Um, obviously, there's always been talk of Gennady Golovkin, how he's uh, the biggest and baddest in the 160-pound division. But today, you've done something that he has yet to do. You you stopped the number two uh, middleweight in your division. He hasn't fought a number two, not even a top five yet. Does this make you the best middleweight in the division? No, no I don't think so. I think, um, 
you know, I still have a lot to, to prove. You know, I'm a new champion. I'm, I'm the new kid on the block. So, um, you know, with the Miguel Cotos or the, or the Canelos and everybody who really kind of solidified their spot as a top uh, champion, you know, I just have a lot to prove. You know, I, like I said, it's not really my job to see where I fit inside of the middleweight division. It's just my job to get in there and fight and win. And where they place me, you know, it's all good. Because I'm, as long as I'm winning, you know, to me, that's what's most important. <clears throat> you know, again, a lot of times when a fighter hurts an opponent, they're weary of, you know, jumping on the foe for, you know, fear of punching yourself out, kind of like Mike Jones against Soto Karras few years ago. Right. But, you know, you seize the moment and really showed an incredible kill, killer instinct. Um, I know when you're in there, I'm not really thinking a lot, but how did you really pl always plan to jump on it? And did you ever think about punching yourself out? Or? Um, I didn't think about poking myself out because I knew from his eyes that he was really hurt. And if it would have been different, I probably would have paced myself a little bit more because as we've seen with the Sergio Mora fight, I went in carelessly and, you know, I got clipped. Right? Don't laugh about that. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing that we were in there with a power puncher, we was already cautious of his, of his best asset, which was just that. And I knew if I had an opportunity to get him hurt, that we was going to do it differently this time. I mean, I don't know if it was a lot different, but I knew he was really hurt. So if I knew that, I put my punches together right. And then I think I, I don't know, I might have got headbutted or I got hit somewhere in the, in the middle of the exchange. So I, in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, you might have to pace yourself if he's able to regroup and get himself together. But he wasn't. So you're saying that right when he went into the corner, the first time when he was buckled, that you knew that he was done? Well, I just, I mean, I can't really remember everything hand for hand, but I just remember seeing his eyes and seeing his legs and just not stop punching. So. And what is that adrenaline rush like? Yeah. Man, it's, it, I don't know, it all happens so fast. I mean, I can't really put it into perspective. It's, I'm still kind of like on cloud nine, but, you know, I'll go back and I'll watch the tape and hopefully I can relive those moments again. Danny. This is our so, Sirius XM, what's going on? Yeah, First, I want to congratulate thank you. Thank you, brother. Excellent performance. It. You definitely showed it. Definitely one of the best middleweights in the world, thank for sure. Much. But I, I want to know, it. what do you want for Christmas? I got it I got it right here, my brother, my little boy. And his, birth, his birthday was just the other day, so we're going to celebrate tomorrow. I'm going to take him to the trampoline place. <laughs> we're going to go to the Brooklyn Nets game. We're probably go to Disneyland, maybe for Christmas. So that's all. I got everything I need right here, boss. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Daniel, uh, really two, two quick questions. You talked, uh, when this fight was made, you talked that you started camp earlier, so this has been a long camp for you, so what, if anything, did that do as far as an advantage? And then the second question is, that, again, this was a, you know, this fight ended really quickly. And well, let me answer the first question first, not because you will. But yeah, we did start camp early, this uh, training camp. We had a 10-week camp. And I want to give credit to my man Scooter over here, you know, because he's, he's made sure that I was in the best shape possible. And we wanted to have a pre-camp to be ready for camp. Because I remember Joe Calzaga was saying that he never sparred until he was in shape to really uh, compete in sparring matches. So, you know, that idea for me made sense. And I wanted to be strong and ready for camp and had a nice long seven-week camp up there. And, you know, everything was well. So, uh, so today was, was a minute right into the fight. Uh, the Mora fight in August was, was two rounds. How much turnaround time do you need to get back in there? Do you want to get uh, Tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> I want to get right back in there, man. Sergio Mora put a tweet out today, too. No. Yeah, he did. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, you, know, it, this is a, you know, this is a fight or, or this is a sport where, you know, if the fans aren't really intrigued by it, then your stock or, you know, you, wow. your stardom really doesn't grow. So I'm not sure if the fans want to see a Shoji on more rematch more so than a, the winner of Sanders and Lee or or Triple G or somebody like that. So, you know, we'll go back to uh, obviously the man, Al Heyman, see what he wants to do. He gives the best advice and, and um, we'll take it from there. But I think I'll probably be back maybe first quarter of next year. That might not be too long. Sounds like you can make the March 17th uh, St. Patrick's Day with Andy Lee if he's able to win. Is that something that you would like to do? He normally fights. Look a little. Look a little. Who's excited about that? That'll be cool. I mean, I'm not the boss here. Right? 
I, I, this, I, the two belts are for sitting in front of this guy right over I here. Know, right? Right? <laughs> I think that'll be cool. It'll definitely be something that I'll be looking forward to. Andy Lee is a, a tremendous champion, um, very strong, uh, an exciting fighter to obviously put it here in New York City. It would be another New York City type of feel that the fans would appreciate. There's a lot of Irish fans here and there's you know a lot of supporters for myself. So I think it would be another sellout. We're gonna do three more questions and then we're gonna let this man leave with his son and go home and celebrate and get some sleep. And he's gotta wake up tomorrow and watch no, the fight. I want to Shake Shack, man. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, I'm not sure. Dan, I'm not sure if any clean shots were landed, but if you could give us a power ranking, um, you know, all your opponents and where Peter Quinn ranks as far as power. No, you know what? It was a shot that he missed that I just like felt the wind and I felt the power. I was like, man, I, you know what I mean? I was just like trying to avoid those shots because I knew that, um, I knew he was a strong guy just by the way he threw his punches. So I knew it probably was going to be a long night if I wasn't careful. So I wanted to make sure my defense was tight. But I, I think I do remember kind of like pulling his defense down and catching with a nice right hand, and, and that's where started everything. But he's a strong champion. We know he has the, the heart and the will, you know, to continue to fight if he could. But, you know, hopefully we can do it again. Danny, you got the stats right there. Drop the knowledge on them. The stats? Okay. Final shots. Punches thrown, 53 by myself, 16 by Quillen. Uh, total punches connected, 27 by myself, 2 by Quillen. So yeah, he only landed two shots on me. I don't know if that one shot gave me this knot right here. <laughs> Peter Quillen is a strong guy, but and, and even before the fight, we knew that his punch count wasn't really high. Like he wasn't, he wasn't that guy who threw a lot of punches. So I knew that if he was going to throw a lot of hard shots, it wasn't going to be that many. Um, so the goal was to win the first three rounds and just try to have him play catch up, and then that would have fit right into my game plan, which is box, move, and you know, uh, take him into deep waters. Like, like your hat says in the back. <laughs> Danny, c congratulations. I'll be here, brother. I'll be here to you. Oh, love. okay. What's up, Danny? Congratulations so on the victory. Coming into the fight, did you were you aware that Peter was susceptible to the right hand? And when you heard him, were you surprised that you got to him that quick? I was surprised that he was hurt that quick. Because um, when I entered the ring, you know, we, we were staring at each other. And, like, he had to... The heart, like the, the lion in him, you know what I mean? You could just see that animal status, and I was just like, man, like this guy means business, you know what I mean? I may have to, you know, box a little bit the first couple of rounds. Um, but like I said, I'm 100% uh, into my ability and what I'm capable of doing. And uh, when I heard him, I knew I was going to get him out of there. I just really did. I was just a little worried about punching myself out. But I knew the fact that he was hurt, it was either going to be a matter of time, whether it was a second round or a third round, but I knew I was going to get him out of there. Thank you. Last question to your right over here. Danny, this is Stevie K from BoxersAndBrawlers.com. This question is for you and Mr. Rozier. Yes, sir. If the fight had gone longer, what was your game plan coming into this fight? Well, my game plan, like I alluded to earlier, my game plan was to obviously win the first half of the fight in points and then have him play catch up. Because if we know Peter Quillen, we know he's, he's not technically sound. He's, uh, he, he lunges in with his punches and he actually goes for the knockout each and every time he fights. So I knew if he was going to have to play catch up, he would be desperate and, and lunging in and you know, me being a sharpshooter, that would have just fit right into my, my game plan. Yeah. All good? Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Happy holidays. I was trying. That was the main point. Thank you. Brooklyn, we did. Oh no, my mic is over. Go for it, man. Go for it. Sandy, have your little man hold one of the belts. There you go. There you go. Say it anyways. Scream it out, bro. Brooklyn, we did it. Jeff, put your hands up. Brooklyn, we did it. Jeff, put your hands up. Jeff. Here we go. One more time. BK, Brooklyn, we did it.